So today I'm here with Ben Keith and he owns Star Sports and I'm going to find out a little bit more about him. So Ben, firstly I'd like to start at the beginning. So how did it all begin for you? Can I start by saying thank you for inviting me onto your show today. <laughs> I love um, following your progress on Twitter and um, I wish you every success. <laughs> and I hope there'll be more people like yourself come into racing, enjoy the game and introduce other people. <laughs> so, well, my... Um, demise I suppose started um, when I was 12 or 13 years old my my dad came home from work and he said he had a work stew at the local dog track Hove Dogs and he was going with my mum my mum said look I don't want to go um, you go with your dad get 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 away from from under my feet and my dad said yeah come to the dogs I said I don't want to go to the dogs dog racing what's that I went to the dogs, I sat there, we sat in the restaurant, I had two, a two pound bet, a place bet, um, I played it safe on a dog called Sarah Jones and I looked out and the, the lights came up, the hair is on the move, the, you know, the, tr the traps cracked open, the dogs um, came out, Sam's fitting up everywhere, I saw Tic Tacs working in the betting ring, I saw bookmakers with chalk quickly rubbing, rubbing the odds out, the, the, the chalk dust going up in the air, I saw action. I saw a community, I saw um, ambition and people that I, I could relate to and that was it and I think that um, I was blessed to have gone dog racing that night because I, I, I think that everybody has a talent and sometimes they I, I really, really do believe that. It, you know, I think that emotional intelligence isn't isn't something that is scored, um, but I think that everybody has a talent, and I was very lucky to find a passion that I then learned a lot about, and that became talent. You know, I think a lot of people, young people, they talk about is it ten thousand hours or sixteen thousand hours or something like that, and they, you know, Tiger Woods practicing the putting again and again, and you know, they become obsessed and they become brilliant at what they do. But I'm very, very grateful to um, Greyhound Racing, betting industry, the game itself, for a good living, friends, associates, happy times, ups and downs, ambitions, um, and, and you know, the community that I'm a part of. So you never had a plan B? Never, no, no. I, I, after the dogs that night, every day, uh, every weekend, I'd go and wash cars, uh, and I'd buy the racing post and sporting life, life every day. And I was the school bookie, and that gave me the money with washing the cars. I, I was bunking off school to go to Plumpton, and, and one of the bookies from Hove Dogs, his name was Bubbles. He was a lovely person. He was he worked for a bookie who's still a bookie to this day called Charlie Miller at Hove Dogs, and Bubbles worked for Charlie. And he and, and I'd you know have something over my school uniform, and he, he'd be waiting at the gate. I'd get the the train and to the back of the race course and then he'd be there and he'd, he'd say to the man on the gate no no he's with me and through I'd go and this was the, the days when there were tic tacs everywhere there were people clerking with big, big ledgers and I was completely intoxicated and you know it, so every chance to bunk off school and go to the dogs or the horses I was there um, in the school holidays, I'm very, very grateful to, to bookmakers like Bo Brown at, at, um, at, at Hove Dogs. I used to go and shadow clerk, which means you'd have the proper clerk clerking in the book, and I'd stand next to the clerk and I'd shadow clerk. So I'd pick out, I'd get the bets down. I could. I mean, I was 13 years old on this stuff. Um, you know, then I'd work in in London. Uh, there's a big company called City Index. They do financial spread betting. They used to do sports spread betting. I used to go and do work experience there. A gentleman by the name of Paul Austin, he was the boss. He gave me a job there when I was 17. Finished my A-levels a week later, I started there. That was it, that's all I wanted to do. Um, and there was a guy there called Neil Channing. You'll meet him on your travels. He's a well-known professional gambler. Him and his um, uh, business partner, Steve Todd, they used to give me work experience at the racing. They had pitches, I'd go and help them. Um, and I think that the betting industry, by nature, there's winner and there's loser, mm -hmm. right? Fact, 
it is very, very combative. Okay, it is ruthless, but in that combat, you will find very, very kind people who are also grateful and who give you a start. Martin Johnston, um, a bookmaker, he's in the West Country, bets under the name of Jim Racing. Martin um, uh, was the top pro professional punter at City Index. He used to win a lot of money off them. When he made a bet, they completely changed the odds. And, you know, on, on weekends, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of drive in an old banger down to Bournemouth, hope I got, you know, with the old map out, you know, like that, clueless. Right, get to Bournemouth, he'd take me to the Bournemouth Steakhouse. He'd tell me, I'd learn everything from him. Then he was a bookie at the dogs. I'd watch him work at the dogs. He had his betting shops. He had a credit office. I'd sit and learn. And I think that um, the betting industry does have teachers and uh, I think that they should be lauded. There's not as many of them as there should be. I'd like to see um, possibly on your journey you might do a day with the BHA graduates course. You go there there's hope in the young people's eyes, there's excitement, they're grateful, but I don't know, there's 15 or 20 of them, the, the list has been whittled down from hundreds, they're graduates, not people who've left school. I believe that right across the game, you know, these days, thousands of betting shops are closed, automation has killed so many people's jobs. There should be more pressure on prominent people, people who are successful, people who've had money out of the game, big companies to be thinking about how they can employ more young people because it's not just a job, it is a community and if you welcome people when they're young, they'll work with you for life. So you know what you said when you were younger, you know, you shadowed a lot of people, do you find there's a lot of graduates out there now that are sort of coming forward to ask to do some of the things that you did? Yes, I mean, one thing like yourself that I've very much enjoyed in the last couple of years, I joined Twitter. Mm. And I think that with Twitter, 95% is absolutely fantastic, 5% is not very nice, but hey, isn't that everything? You know, there's always going to be somebody who's going to want to chip you or, or, or whatever. They've got their own issues, good luck to them. Um, but I've... I've done business with lots of people on Twitter, I've answered questions to lots of people on Twitter, and actually I've employed a lot of people off Twitter. You know, they write in, they say, can I go and have a day in the office? Whatever, can I have a Skype and a chat? Have you got any advice? And um, it's, it's, it's been fantastic for me. Yes, so look, I get young people, um, drop me a line or write to the office uh, very regularly and it's only a pleasure to say I can't give everybody a job yeah this is the thing but um, you know it's always a pleasure to encourage people and, and try and send them in the best direction one thing that I found especially with Twitter like it's such a big racing community and you can find a lot you know about certain things like I didn't know much about dog racing but I've picked up a lot from Twitter and I feel like it's such a welcoming place like you said it can be nasty but it's a welcoming place where you can sort of reach out to people. I think that you're so right there I think that Twitter really is a directory and you know again if somebody blanks you or they're, they're not very helpful they probably weren't worth trying to mm. have a chat with anyway but essentially um, you know, I think that racing is a sport that does have delusions of grandeur. You know, I, I, I saw recently somebody put a, um, it was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or some type of game show, and it was, um, uh, can you name the horse here that's won two grand nationals in a row? So like, to Tiger Run, yeah? Mm. Right. And like, this guy had to like phone a friend and it was like massively tense as if, as if he, it, this was like the secret, you know, mm. that, that no one knew. You know, but also, it, this wasn't Red Run a million years ago, this mm. was two minutes ago, he won the last two, yeah? So, I mean, it's sort of, you know, um, uh, 
it is it is very much a village and it is a small bubble mm. people who get a bit too ahead of themselves in it and think they're superstars they're not really mm. yeah um, and on the whole most people will be friendly and helpful and as well like you know when people can be a little bit nasty on twitter i think there's a way of dealing with that because i found especially when someone has been like a little bit rude you can diffuse the situation so that it doesn't go into like a huge argument because you see so many people arguing and stuff mm. but I, again I just think that that platform of Twitter can be a really great place you know and it can give a lot of opportunities to people and open people's eyes like you know when my TV wasn't working the other day I was keeping up with a very small Twitter <laughs> so I didn't even need my TV um, but I'd love to just skip back now to my other question which I'm really keen to know you said a bit earlier about who your hero was growing up could you tell us who your hero was? Well, when I was a boy, I used to, um, my dad um, at the weekends would regularly take me to the London dog tracks where, you know, you've got to, to remember, I mean, look, this was in the early 90s, I mean, in, in the late 70s and 80s, it really was much bigger, but, you know, you'd go to a London dog track for a big night's racing in the early 90s, and, you know, the action in the betting ring was something that people now couldn't appreciate yeah and I would go and stand and watch uh, you know the, the legendary bookmakers of the time I'd stand in front of them and literally it was a scrum you know <laughs> but, but but you could you could cut the atmosphere like cheese it was incredible you know and um, uh, the bookmaker Tony Morris um, Tony Morris was uh, a Rolls Royce of an on-course bookmaker I would say that he's the best greyhound racing bookmaker there's ever been and ever will be um, and he was very very professional very calm immaculate um, he was just the real deal and i think that that was another thing that i was lucky with that i had these people to watch and i think that you know you go back and you study big bookmakers' careers. They're different, but they're the same. Mm. Yeah, and I think that it's that ladder that you go up. And in gambling, by the nature, you're going to have, as well as good runs, very, very bad runs. In those bad runs, I think that you have to look at your hero. You know, if 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 you look at Davy Russell, we sponsor Davy Russell. The man is a gladiator, right? I, I I turn the video, I turn the Twitter on, and I see him. He looks like Stephen Hawking with the the neck on, and he's still doing his Star Sports video. You know, next week he'll go out, he'll break his neck again, and don't worry about it. I'll have a you know lie down at home, and I'll be riding again three weeks later, fearless. Yeah. yeah? So you don't get to ride Grand National winners without falling off horses at Ludlow and breaking your arm and legs right and you don't get to be a big bookie or a big professional gambler w without doing your absolute bollocks mm. so you've got to learn to do that and I think that having those heroes you look at them and you think well they didn't get there without any bumps in the road mm. and they but the main thing is that they worked on their professionalism and they kept going mm. Was there ever a point where you thought you couldn't perhaps, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to do this? Um, without a doubt. I think that every single, uh, you know, when you look at professionals in anything, think about snooker. Mm. You know, I don't know much about snooker, but I would imagine that, you know, Ronnie O'Sullivan, Judd Trump, what they earn their earning capacity is many multiples of just like the number 20 in the world, mm -hmm. yeah? And I think that virtually all bookmakers and all professional gamblers have and continue to have very bad runs that test their mettle. I find that every couple of years I'm walking along and I think I've done it, I've nailed it, everything's fine, I've got a fantastic book of clients this is it, just steer, steer it home, right? And then immediately for like six months, I'll lose every day and I'm like, oh my God, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you know. Um, so, you know, look, when you're a bookie, you're only as good as your punters mm -hmm. and punters who lose don't want to lose forever. Mm -hmm. They're looking for information.
they're looking for systems, they're, they're working their techniques and they can very well become winning punters and as a bookie you only know that when they've been winning, yeah? yeah? So I mean, you know, it's, um, I think that also, you know, my dad always says this, he says as human beings we massively overestimate time mm. we go oh look i haven't seen that person for ages like a year or or, or they'll say oh well, th this was another time a hundred years ago that's a grain of dust in the in time mm -hmm. yeah now and that extends to sample size you know i meet people who tell me that they're professional gamblers because they've got a system on the rugby that you know they worked it for one season they had 80 bets and you know they won their five or six percent it's like look when you've had three or four thousand bets call me and let's see all the zigzags the ups and downs do you know what i mean yeah. and it's i think that one thing to remember as a bookmaker and as a professional gambler losing runs can go on much much longer than you think right. and you have to be ready for them yeah um and i think that during them you have to do two things you have to say am i doing something wrong here do i need to change what i'm doing evaluate it calmly without the emotion of thinking i hate losing because to win you have to lose you have to lose you know people like to say oh show me a loser show me a, 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 a someone who's a content loser i'll show you a loser that's not really true as a professional gambler or a bookmaker you've got to be a good loser you've got to you've got to say okay this person is is clueless i'm going to beat this punter i'm going to let him keep on having his big doubles of you know one to three and one to five buying money buying money because I'll wait for him to have his bad run right. yeah or are you wrong and has somebody got an edge on you and you don't see it so you've got to be you've got to have a strong character to say right I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay alongside you here and I'm gonna wait for my good run to come or you've got to say I can't beat you bye and look that for me is on your travels if you meet other bookmakers you'll meet bookmakers who bet to an opinion they look at a race they say i don't fancy the favorite i want to lay the favorite here the next race they'll say i like the favorite i'm going to be best price the others that's too much of a head fuck for me i'd rather look at the man you know so like right, new client opens he wants to play big he sends in all of the compliance bump right this guy sold a business for 100 million quid. He's in his early 50s, he's semi-retired, there's holiday homes all over the place, and he wants to bet on the football on a Saturday or Sunday, having 20, 30 grand bets. I wanna take those bets, right. right? When you meet somebody maybe who's like 29, and it's sort of, this person doesn't really have a job. They don't really leave their bedroom. They've got the sort of rain man glaze how are they earning money? Mm. I think that they're earning money because they've got super duper spreadsheets and they get money out of bookings. I don't really want to take their bets. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a bit like I play the man rather than the race. And at the same time, um, when you think about very, very big businessmen, people in, you know, of a position in life, they're going to meet people who are courting them, who want to curry favour with them. So I've got people who bet with me who lose lots of money on the football, but they win a bit back on the racing because somebody's somebody's whispering in their ear. Oh. But I think to myself, look, I'll give to take. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's a balance yeah. because I'm playing the man over a year. Mm. I'm not sort of, because if I say, well, you know, uh, you can't have any bets on the horses. He's going to say, well, I don't want any silly 50 grand bets in running on football. So it's a bit like I'm thinking, well, you know, how does, am I, am I still making a profit? Yeah. yeah. So as a bookmaker, my business would win a lower margin than a Labrooks or a Corals, mm -hmm. but it's a completely different business. So is this from years of your experience and, you know, learning essentially on the job when you were younger, is this how you know what to look for? Because you know you said it's all different to other bookmakers. You can't really compare it to other bookmakers, can you? Look, it's all I've done. So obviously I've learned something, but I make many mistakes. I make mistakes still today mm -hmm. because 
I have to make decisions. And I think that there does come a point when you're a professional gambler or a bookmaker, if you're not making mistakes, I'd say that you're probably leaving a lot of profit on the, on the table that you're not picking up. Right, I'm a credit bookie. Hunter, the, my bigger clients bet with me on credit. So they have, they have an account that they settle weekly or fortnightly. Maybe it's for two grand. Maybe it's for half a million quid, right? And this, this is, most of these people are business people. This is how they're used to doing business. They do business. They pay when they've done their business, mm. right? Now, obviously, over the years, you know, I've been knocked, I've been, I've been not paid for huge sums of money. But essentially, if at the end of a story, I think, well, you know, yeah, I did get knocked for 250 grand by that punter, but before that he lost two million. How bad? Yeah? Now, if, no, if at the end of the year I have absolutely no bad debt, I've got to think, well, like, I've got to have some bad debt. You know, it's like, if, if Woolworths had no sweeties nicked, I'd say that the security man's a bit too tough, isn't he? Yeah. You know, it's a bit like, well, let, let's let them at least look at the sweets here. You don't need to sort of, sort of electrocute them or something, <laughs> you know, when they go near the co yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, um, you know, again, it's that balance. But I think that... Tell you a story. There is a very, very big bookmaker at the moment. I won't say who it is. But I have somebody who do, does business with me. He's a commission agent. He passes big bets to me. He knows the bookmaker. When I met this commission agent, I wanted to know all about this bookmaker. I sat in front of him and I said, this man is a genius. And this commission agent, and I said, how did he do it? And he looked back at me and it was really just, well, you know, he opened the shops, he, he, he kept them nice and clean and tidy. He thought he could offer that slightly better service than the other people and he kept doing it. I was like, no, 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 no. Tell me the moment of genius. And I've asked like three or four times yeah. and I've sat there, I'm so disappointed. But all it is really is common sense. Yeah. And I think that so often, particularly punters and bookies themselves you know I've got a lot of punters who bet with me I've made a good profit laying their bets they've had their accounts closed elsewhere but a lot and you go into a lot of trading rooms and everybody wants to be hocus pocus like oh no no this guy he he's got special information on this trainer particular trainer there in the west country or he's an expert on on like you know flat racing at Wolverhampton or whatever he just had a couple of winning days and and coincidentally some of them shortened up let's let's give the guy a bit of a spin and see how he actually does over time mm -hmm. yeah um and i think but try and keep it easy try and keep it straightforward also if you want to be too granular on everything and examine every single bet mm -hmm. and look at every single race how can you how can you grow a business yeah. You know, I want to have betting shops all over the country. I want to have people all over the world betting on my website, yeah? I can't go to the same betting shop every day to, collect the, to check the toilets are clean or, the, or that every single punter gets laid, every single bet that they've ever wanted with Star Sports. Mm. I'll just try to put systems in that give a better service. Do you ever have people come to you to say, I really want to properly bet and they want to become a professional gambler but they don't know particularly how, so they perhaps ask you what definitely, to do? Definitely, definitely. There, there is a story actually of, um, I can say his name because it's his nickname. <laughs> He's a bit of a legend at Star Sports, uh, Skateboard Eddie. Oh. And uh, uh, several years ago we had a young, young guy um, turn up and on a skateboard from the job centre. The job centre said, we've got this guy, he wants to work for a bookie. Um, can, can he come and have a job with you? Come on, come on, on Monday. Kid arrives on a skateboard. <laughs> a couple of years later, he'd been working in our professional gambling department and he had a legendary run. And um, uh, he left in a Mercedes to travel the world with over half a million pounds. 
Um, but he'd made me a lot of money too, so so that was okay. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, um, you know, so he wasn't skateboard Eddie anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, but no, of course there are. And look, yeah, like so many young people who who text me on Twitter. When I was 19, um, I worked in Gibraltar for Victor Chandler, who was, uh, you know, uh, an incredible bookmaker, obviously he's retired now. And anyway, uh, w one day uh, there was a tip that came down from the trading room and it was for a horse called Pension Fund and Pension Fund was sort of 25, 33 to one and the, the senior people had been out with someone associated with the horse and he got a bit pissed and said, she's gonna win right so I thought that's good enough for me yeah. right so I had a few hundred quid on it and I won 10 grand the next day I went into the office and I'd called Lofty Lofty worked for one of the bookies who I'd done work experience for as a kid and I said Lofty are you ready this is it we're gonna set sail right he said I'm ready right and I went in and um, I probably made the biggest error of my life because on your travels, you'll also hear about a man called Tony Bloom. And Tony Bloom is the most famous and successful professional gambler in the world. Anyway, at the time, this was obviously over 20 years ago, Tony was a much younger man. He, he was running this spread betting business there, which never really got going. And he was betting on things called Asian handicaps at the time was a very new thing it was a way to bet on football and he used to come out and write his bets on the whiteboard and we'd all know what, what he'd had a bet on I don't think he'd do that anymore and um, uh, I said to Tony look I'm not really sure about all this Asian handicap thing um, I, I'm, I'll take my 10 grand and go and be a bookie Right. right, so I thank pension fund, but maybe I don't really because Tony went on to become a multi squillionaire, and I really should have worked for him forever and like you know been, been on the firm there, and and so I came back and when I was at the races suffering and and uh, making errors on an hourly basis, all these people were working for uh, Tony were gone gone sky high, and I was sort of hearing stories of it like oh great, uh, but look, there we go. Thank God I I managed to achieve something in the yeah. end. How did then Star Sports begin? Well, I, I was doing a lot of my own betting, as mm -hmm. I say, and I used that money. I used to spin around the betting shops when there was bad each way or mm -hmm. when there were mistakes on the football coupons and I'd double and treble and fourfold them up. And when I had a good run, I'd buy a pitch or I'd buy a betting shop and I failed with my first betting shops. I bought half a dozen shops in Sussex and I didn't keep it basic mm -hmm. I didn't keep it easy I'd look at a betting shop and I'd say I want to turn this shop round I believe I can yeah and I'd take I'd buy betting shops that were failing mm -hmm. and they continued to fail because they were in the wrong positions it, it wouldn't matter if I had you know Naomi Campbell and Cindy Crawford working behind the counter wasn't in the right place to have a bucket, right? right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I failed. Mm -hmm. And thank God, I managed to sell a couple of the shops to um, Betfred, uh, which gave me money to go again. And you know, I became a bookie at the Dogs. I gained a bit of profile when Roger Cairns at City Wall, now Central Park, I had a pitch there. They had very busy Sunday night open race cards, dog, good dogs running. Then I got a pitch at Walthamstow, which was a den. You know, Walthamstow was a very, very aggressive place to do business, but by God, I learned a lot there. Yeah. Um, I did very, very well on the open racing, which is the good racing, and I took the big bets, but I made the error of taking the big bets on the graded racing, which wasn't the very good racing. So I used to sort of get my money on a Thursday and a Saturday and give it back to them all on a Tuesday, <laughs> but you only learn one way. Uh, then, uh, how old would I have been? Sort of like mid twenties. At the same time, you know, I had some big punters betting with me at the Stow. Um, you know, a lot of high-profile people used to go there. I moved them on to to bet with me on the phone. I used to go to bet, bet at Coventry Dogs. Some punters there came to bet with me, who still bet with me to this day. You grow the business, you grow the network. It goes on and on and on. The pro punting built. I built, you know, a business there. Um, you know, 
this is the thing I think that so much of business is about delegating. You can't, you can do everything yourself, but you're only going to do so much. Um, and then, you know, uh, got a website, open spread betting. We've got a, a sports spread betting company. They've bet online for a long time. Gone back into shops, learned, I do it right now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was a bad bookmaker of betting shops in my 20s. I believe I'm a good bookmaker in betting shops now. Time will tell. Um, and, you know, I keep finding punters. Uh, and look, I, uh, some I want to lay, some I don't want to lay, but life goes on. So, you know, when you say you find punters, do you sort of then just say, look, if you come with me, I can show you some good odds? Is that, what you, is that the way it works? Look, I think that the gambling industry has grown out of all, all proportion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you could remember, like, you know, when our mums and dads were young, they'd go, they'd go um, past the betting shop. It was all like boarded up, wasn't it? And there was like the frilly, the frilly stuff curtain, and you go through it, and there'd be a cloud of smoke as people went in and out. That was it. Yeah, and there wasn't online betting, mm -hmm. and there was very big betting tax, so people did bet on the phone, but they didn't really do that much of it. Yeah, and people went to the racing, and they congregated in the betting ring. Now. There's betting exchanges, there's bingo halls, there's online bingo, there's apps, there's there's every type of way to bet. And, you know, look, it's something that probably hasn't done our industry favours, but every time you turn the television on, now you watch the cricket or the football or whatever, there's, there's bookies advertising everywhere. Mm. Yeah? So it's enormous. Yeah. Everybody, every type of person bets. Yeah. So I don't think there's any need to compete with other bookies. I think that the bookies who fail are the bookies who come in, they say, well, everybody else is on odds checker, I better go on odds checker. Mm -hmm. All the other bookies do this, I'll do the same. And they think, how bad? I do the same as Skybet, I do the same as Bet365, surely everybody will bet with me. Well, not really, because they're already betting with Bet365 and, and Skybet if you're offering them that service. Mm -hmm. I think that in the betting industry, there are so many people who bet that everybody as a bookmaker can run their own race. I think people also, this is something that's forgotten in the, in the modern world. People on the whole bet with their own, right? When you go to Irish areas of London, the Paddy Power betting shops, yeah. these shops are banged out. They've got four times as many punters as the Cal Coral Labrooks next mm -hmm. door. You know, young people, they bet with Bet365, Bet365, they market, don't they, mm -hmm. to young people. Very, very posh people, they bet with Fit Stairs. You know, it's, I, I think that the people who bet with Star Sports really, on the whole, are people who want a good, traditional bookmaking service where they can speak to competent operators, probably their business people, and um, uh, I'm not trying, I don't really think about what other bookies are doing. If I'm three and every other bookie is, is seven or two, go and take the seven or two with them. Uh, I've chosen to be three, that's fine. You know, and if really you're somebody who wants the best price every time, I'm not going to be your bookie. But you're not going to get to be somebody else's punter if you have best price every time and you have more than a couple of hundred quid on. So it's, my service is not for everybody, but nor is any other bookies. I've got my punters, they've got theirs. I always wondered how different bookies differed because I didn't, I thought, you know, this year has been a big year that I've learned a lot. Um, you know, especially about that bookmakers and what happens. But I didn't realise that, you know, different bookies do different things. But what I wanted to know was obviously back in the day when there wasn't social media and there wasn't apps, does that mean now that the betting shops are a lot quieter than perhaps 10 years ago? Um, I think that, look, that you hear this word proliferation of betting shops. That's like, you know, when you go into certain areas of London and, and sort of like, you know, you're in a 50 yard spot and there's four betting shops that th they were opened because people were betting on the on the on the, the machines the, the the roulette machines yeah. a lot of bookmakers made a lot of money out of that but again it hasn't helped our image as a whole um and meant and those machines have been cut right back now to very small bets mm -hmm. so there's a lot less betting shops look 
People used to get paid in an envelope in cash on a Friday. That helped bookies at the dogs, at the horses and betting shops. That doesn't really happen now. But again, I'm not competing with my betting shop, for my betting shops, right, with, with other betting shops. I sort of am, but I'm not, I'm running my own race. I'm trying to offer a friendly professional service you know you go in a lot of betting shops now the toilets are dirty they haven't put the papers up properly the staff aren't interested I'm trying to offer a at least professional service where people can go in and it is a bit more social it's a bit more that the manager can have a bit of chat with you about the racing whatever right so um, Yes, there are less betting shops. That doesn't worry me because I'm looking to have bet betting shops rather than, say, like a Labrooks or a Coral where they've got one every few hundred yards and good luck to them. I'd love to own their business. <laughs> Let's not start trying to make out I don't respect them or whatever. They'd say to me, you worry about yourself, kid. Right? But essentially, I'd probably like to have, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 shops around the country, one in each big town, one in each big city, where when somebody says, you know, I want to have bigger bets or I want to have a bit more you know a social environment a nice shop to spend time in I go to Star Sports rather than I want to have a £10 bet on the next dog race where is the nearest betting shop I can't compete with Corals on Aprox there so I'll try and have the odd very nice shop that people can go to and let's say you think that it's better to have just one betting shop in one place like one area it, when you say it's better, I don't want to be pedantic, but it's it's better for me right, okay. because I offer that different service. Yeah. Uh, there's no point me having you know um, three betting shops in Crawley mm. because I've got three places offering the same service. I may as well have one good one, which will get the footfall punters off that area, like any betting shop. But then the more serious gamblers in in a place like Crawley, and I don't have a shop there, I just picked it. Right, mm. we'll go there. So it's, it's more of a destination rather than a, a huge industrial thing. Mm. One thing that's really nice about the shops I find is they're very clean, but even, you know, the colours... The star shops. The star yes, shops, so yeah. yes. So I love the colour scheme, the blue and the yellow. Where did that idea come from? Blue is our colour and we have a yellow star, so <laughs> you know, there's, no, there's no sort of, uh, you know, Saatchi and Saatchi branding secret mm -hmm. there. But did that all come from you? You decided on those colours, you picked well, them? The marketing people and all of that, we're, we're very lucky. We've got a guy called Bill Estelle who, who advises us on, on this type of thing and he's got his company square in the air. You know, his, his work is sharp, it catches the eye. Bill is hugely talented and we've always been lucky to have his catchy adverts mm. over the years and uh, his style and taste. And did you come up with the name Star Sports? Yes, it was Star Racing and Bill told me to change it to Star Sports. Ah, yeah. I like it because especially you know, if you're walking down the road you see this big yellow star and it does stand out. Well, this is it. We truly try to push that and in time people know that's mm. Star Sports. So, so far how many shops are there in the UK? Uh, there's six but we've got lots more opening. Uh, we're opening lots of the William Hill shops that have closed and look and there's other deals in the offing I, I'd hope to be there's a there's a lot where we're signing leases we've signed leases the shops are being done out very quickly I'd like to have um, you know 25 or 30 so if I say what's next for Star Sports, are we, would you say it's more like we're looking out for the new shops to arrive? Uh, what today's today and tomorrow I'll keep going and keep betting in one way or another and keep uh, slowly expanding the business and um, I'm very grateful. Mm. Exciting. I have to say as well, so when I came in I saw your dog. Do you have any horses? No, I don't know. I'm a bit scared of horses, oh, actually. Really? Yeah, I don't know why. I grew up in the countryside and I was always scared of cows and horses. I love dogs. Ah, so you never have any horses? No, I'm, I, no I, I, I sort of... I think, is it going to kick me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you've only got... Is it just the one greyhound? He's a whippet. Oh, he's a whippet? Oh, we, we, a no, no, no. My family have had retired greyhounds before. Mm. He's an elderly gentleman. He's about 13 now. Oh. But when he um, goes to the dog track in the sky, I hope to get myself a retired greyhound. 
And then with um, retiring retired racehorses, but is that the same process with the dogs? Yes, there's huge work that goes on by the GBGB, the Greyhound Board. They, you know, um, the work done to home retired greyhounds is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, anybody who says it isn't uh, is trying to promote themselves, not any type of agenda that is actually wrong. Um, and um, I'm delighted to be part of a sport that takes the homing of greyhounds and the wonderful pets that they are so seriously and I wouldn't be part of that sport if it wasn't the case because I love dogs myself. Yeah, those are my questions. There we go. Thank you so much. Nice it's to meet you. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much. And I will leave the links at the bottom if you would like to look at the retiring of any racehorses and greyhounds. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.